Hello everyone, hope you're keeping well and welcome uh, for today's message. And as we uh, continue with our time together, let's just open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord. We know that you have a good, good plan for all of us, Lord. And Lord, even though the things might be shaking, uh, you shaking the earth and you shaking those that are uh, in this earth to turn their hearts and their minds and their, their lives back to you, Lord. And as they continue to do that, through your power and your Holy Spirit, we ask that these verses and this message for today will give people the hope and encouragement that they need during this season. So as we open up the scriptures, Lord, bless everybody, be with them, guide them, and protect them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, what a week it's been, hey? One filled with lots of uh, rumors of wars and nations against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms. But what does it say as we open up? Matthew tells us, when these things start to happen, look up because your redemption draws near. What am I speaking of? What's going on in Russia and Ukraine and all the sanctions and uh, threats that's coming from all the different regions that's causing great um, uncertainty, uncertainty for a lot of people. And also there's uh, uh, the, the news that's coming out is portraying certain um, uh, narratives. Uh, but we also know that we've got to look behind what's going on to see the spiritual implications of what's happening. As it is in heaven, let it be on earth. That's what our cry is. But we understand that sometimes that conflict that's happening in the heavenly realms can be played out here um, on earth that will give us an understanding as to the implications of the spiritual battle that people are in and nations. But we also understand that when we give our time and our lives to the Lord, there's a mission there's a mission and there's a martyrdom discourse that is covered from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35, right through to chapter 11, verses 1. Now, are we going to spend a bit of time in this? Because I feel it's important, not only for the, 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 the scripture that, that uh, is going to be read, but it's also perhaps maybe an application that will allow us to be able to stand fast and may help us appreciate the value of discipleship and also the value of having faith and trust in Jesus. Um, as we're going to look at today, because, you know, um, he came and he modeled a couple of things for us. And if we can hold on to those things, standing on the rock, stay with him being at our, he's our anchor. Uh, but we stand in faith and love whilst we stand with hope that gives us uh, perhaps maybe a peace, a powerful peace during these times and seasons. Let's open up in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. This speaks of the compassion of Jesus. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease amongst the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray that the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Matthew summarizes the Galilean ministry of Jesus and introduces a commission he gave to his disciples in this uh, passage. But let's have a look at a word, a kingdom dynamic, which is compassion. Speaking of Christ-likeness. The truest compassion is only found in the nature of God because only God knows the full depth of of an individual's pain, need, or suffering. Jesus is seen in the essence of feeling human weakness, fully sensing the ravaged condition of human brokenness. Christ-likeness calls us to learn Jesus' heart of compassion, a depth of sensitivity that can be worked in us through the Holy Spirit, reconditioning our hearts to be able to sense the pain of human bondage and to weep with those who weep. Jesus tears, tears over the city of Jerusalem and tears over the tomb of Lazarus. That reveals more than either a sense of rejection by the people of one city or a grief over the death of a personal friend. His compassion brought tears for the hardened of all hearts that were blinded by their sin and for the tragedy of all humankind's vulnerability to death. But love... Love sees beyond the immediate and personal and compassionate, relates to the lost, 
the hurting, the needy and the distressed. It moves more and more into the dimension of discipleship that discovers the compassion of Jesus Christ, following through a personal care and to serve others. We appreciate that we've all been given a certain period of time here on earth and sometimes that may be um, cut short. Or even maybe it's lived out a good life. But that loss still brings in a, a void. And through that loss and that grief, the void that can be fulfilled is, the vo- is, is what Jesus is all about. He's coming into, into that situation. To bring healing, to bring comfort, to bring strength, and to bring you a hope and a future. So no matter what happens in our lives, we can appreciate that whether through loss or victory, we can appreciate that it is he that lives in us that is greater than he that is in the world. And that's just a powerful message for us. No matter what circumstances we're going through, he's with us all the time. But Jesus spoke of something which was quite true in this context. And (laughs) you were saying that the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. As we're going to learn a little bit later on, it's just that multiplication of being able to have that outreach. Have that uh, place of being able to touch people's lives. Bring them into a place of wholeness. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are mentioned. But I want to just share a bit of a word wealth for you. Disciples. Strong's Accordance 3101. From the verb... Manthano, to learn, whose root math suggests thought with effort to put forth. A disciple is a learner, one who follows both the teaching and the teacher. The word is used for the first of the twelve and later to Christians in general. It's that multiplication. It's that feeding of the five thousands that we're going to come to. And that's the provision. goes on to talk about sending out the 12. And in this passage it says, These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go, rather, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preaching, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. That was going on last week's message, wasn't it? Freely receive, freely give. And that's that powerful ministry that we have to bring others into the wholeness that the Lord has for them, but also sometimes to cast out the demons. Remember we spoke of last week how, you know, the account of Job and how Satan attacked Job in all different areas of his life. And in Ezekiel, how, you know, the, the sisters were spoken to about their Loyalty to the one true living God as opposed to bringing in the spirit or the God Molech with a small g. But it also gives us an indication to appreciate the healing power and the casting out of demons that Jesus brings to each and every one of our lives. And that gives us a kingdom dynamic that we can have a look at. What power do Christians have over demons? This is now entering into deliverance. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4.4 4. Very truthful passage of scripture that we can hold on to. The Holy Spirit's filled believer has been given power over all demons. When Jesus Christ sent his apostles out on their mission, he said and he was given to them authority, which is in the Greek word excusia, over all the power, which is dunamis, of the enemy. And Jesus' authority is greater than all satanic power. And when the disciples said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name, Jesus replied, do not rejoice in this, 
that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The believer has unlimited authority over demons in the name of Jesus. And that authority, however, is nothing compared to the blessings of salvation, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, and the glory and authority we will know in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But sometimes we don't see that. Because sometimes in that spiritual realm, Ephesians 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities of this dark age and power. And sometimes when we get those breakthroughs, we go into the next dimension of spiritual uh, uh, breakthrough, uh, closer to eternity, but obviously appreciating that there's an enemy that wants to kill, steal and destroy. So while we see things that are wanting to come from heaven down to earth, we can also appreciate the battle that's going on. The battle that's unseen, but the battle that God has victory over. The both the seen and the unseen. So as things are portrayed and uh, you know narratives are given about how things are playing out here on earth, we hold fast to the rock, we hold fast to the truth, and we hold fast to who we belong to that will make us victorious in Christ because He is victorious and we are victorious in Him. But it also goes on to speak of a warning. Uh, a warning that tells us that persecutions are coming. And he opens up this verse, which I'll let you read through a little later on. Uh, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. And then it goes on to talk about some of the warnings and uh, you know the, the teachings of a disciple. But then it goes on to say, Therefore, do not fear them. For it is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and hidden that will, will not be known. A word wealth is fear, which is phobia. Strong's Accordance 5399. Phobia is defined as a panic that grips a person, causing him to run away, be alarmed, scared, frightened, dismayed, filled with dread, intimidated, anxious, and apprehensive. Jesus is urging his followers not to have a phobia of men, which is destructive but a reverential awe for the fear of God, which is constructive. Proverbs chapter 29 verses 25 addresses the fear syndrome. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be secure. The New Testament upgrades this thought with 1 John verses 4, chapter 4 verses 18. Perfect love casts out fear. Being filled with God's Spirit will cause you to become fearless. As found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7. Speaking of that, you know, sometimes we engage into thoughts, into conversations, and into belief systems that makes us fear man over fearing God. What is that saying to us? Remember, it says we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. That is the first thing that can come into your spirit when engaging in these sort of discussions as i have just myself over the last 48 hours and the spirit of god reminded me number one great is he that's in you that's in the world number two we've not been given a spirit of fear but of power love and sound mind and number three which is found in this passage of scripture which has now been revealed again perfect love casts out fear so when we are operating from a place of love, we're operating from a place of divinity. God is divine. He is the true divine source of love. And that's who we've been made for. Appreciating that sometimes we are operating in that realm and sometimes we are operating in the realm of the heavens, which is where the conflict happens. Good versus dark, evil, good versus wrong uh, and, and evil versus light. And that's where we can stand on our authority that Jesus has given us as his disciples to be able to stand. Having done all to stand. And that's a very encouraging word for us. Because as we continue to do what it says in the Bible. And how it's said to us. 
um, in Matthew chapter eight, uh, 10 verses 8. Heal the sick, clean, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now when you as a person enters into a situation where you find that you are maybe um, releasing whatever it is that has been uh, trapped inside of you. That's the deliverance that Jesus is bringing. You know, just as we've discussed that physical route that they went from Egypt through to Israel, the promised land, sometimes that renewal and that deliverance comes from within. And when we have these things coming from within, coming out, it's it's almost like getting rid of the, the toxins in our body. First of all, we shouldn't let the toxins in. Okay. But secondly, even though they are in, and even if it's something that we're cleansing ourselves from, we do that through prayer and fasting. And that's a very, maybe a message for someone right now. You know, sometimes this doesn't come out except for prayer and, and fasting. And when we do the fasting, we are cleansing ourselves through, from all the things that are in our body and cleansing it, getting our, our wonderful um, temple uh, cleansed. But we do that with prayer. And when we do that alongside with fasting, it's the prayer, the fasting, the worshipping, the reading of the Bible that will help us be uh, renewed and replaced with the Lord's love that he has for us. Anyway, I digress. Jesus uh, spoke of how the disciples were many. Oh, the, the, sorry. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We also appreciate through the persecutions that were coming, Jesus was saying to his uh, followers before they had gone in through to the cities of Israel. And that difficult verse tells us, or has been interpreted as referring to his coming in the transfiguration, the Pentecost, the destruction of Jerusalem as in 70 AD, bringing the judgment, as well as the second coming. Very interesting uh, passage of scripture that's giving us the times and the seasons. Now, if we ever look at what's playing out in this uh, earthly realm, with us standing on the rock in faith and hope and love, we can appreciate that we can see beyond the physical realm into the spiritual realm. And then we know how we can intercede and pray into situations. You know, obviously, there's no one person that wants to see a lost loved one or a lost love or a separation of um, communities, families. But through the Spirit of God, the Ruach Spirit, the wind, the, 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 the love that He has for us, as He did in Genesis, He breathed into our nostrils to fill us with His Holy Spirit. Therefore, we, we mustn't fear Him. Mustn't fear, not, mustn't fear man. We fear God. And that's what we're going to be leading into now, is um, appreciating that these, there's a healthy fear, and then there's an unhealthy fear that brings about dis-ease and discomfort. Jesus spoke about this. And he spoke about or taught on the, the teachings of the fearing of God. Chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 10 verses 27 to 31. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are, two, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. There's a word of comfort right there. There's a word of comfort right there which gives us the hope in the future that the Lord has for us. And even though the persecuted disciples who had gone through that, they continued claiming or proclaiming the gospel, speaking in light the truths that they had previously been taught in private, standing against fear, making his name known well, and uh, doing the Father's business, freely receive, freely give. Now we understand that sometimes we go through these challenges ourselves. We go into a place of illness or a place of um, loss or a place of healing. You know, during these good and bad times, we can appreciate that he's still with us each and every step of the way. Remember the testimony that I shared with you last week about what happened in my own family and how the Lord revealed himself to us during that time. So it's during that time of uncertainty or grief or loss or mourning that we press into the Lord. We press into him. 
we, we, we know that uh, we are his and we are chosen, we are, we are the beloved. But the more we press in, the more he'll be able to bring the healing in whatever situation that uh, is before us. But confessing Christ, as it says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 to 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. That might bring a bit of division. That might bring a bit of discomfort. That might bring a bit of a reality check. We are all pursuing our journey towards the promised land. Physical and spiritual. And as we continue to do that, we bring the loved ones with us. But sometimes that can bring division. Matthew chapter 10 Verses 34 to 39, uh, 39. Do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I do not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves the son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who has, does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life in this life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. What's it talking about? It's not saying that you have to discard your family. In fact, we spoke of it last week, how Jesus extended his um, family, not only from the natural biological family, into the spiritual family. So it's not saying that you have to discard them or disown them. It's really just saying, where's your heart? Is your heart with Christ? Is he number one in your life? Is he the one that's uh, you calling out to? Jesus never attacks the family relationships, but loyalty to him is the paramount message. The loyalty may even uh, result in certain family members being shunned by others. You know, the cross is an instrument of death. It's not the bearing of any burden or distress, but the willingness to give one's life sacrificially for their master. That's what he did on the cross for us. That's what he did on the cross for his father. As we continue our time and as we continue our journey, let's hold true to that. Because it's about keeping him number one, but bringing the family in with you. So that they may be able to know the good and pleasing will of the father. Matthew chapter 10 verses 40 to 42 speaks of support for the messengers of the Lord who receive a blessing. Because in receiving the Lord's representative, they are receiving the Lord himself. And to receive a person or a prophet or a righteous one or a little one is testament to the receiving of Jesus and the one who is the Father who sent Jesus. <coughs> He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of the prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water in the name of the disciples, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Very important opportunity for us to reflect on that, but also reflect on that other verse is by entertaining a stranger, you could be entertaining an angel sent by God. Let's go to Mark. Mark chapter 6, verses 7 to 13. And he called out the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two, and he gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. As he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there until you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment 
than for that city. So they went out and preached, the people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Jesus delegated his power to, these, to, to his disciples with instructions concerning the provisions, the acceptance publicly or rejection. And to shake off the dust was to do so in extreme contempt due to the paganism in that land. And a, pre a preliminary fulfillment of the appointment of the twelve showing a similarity to the preaching of repentance by John the Baptist as well as Jesus himself. It's given us authority. It's given us authority to be able to do these good things. Let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 9. Speaking of the authority. The authority of ministry. This is the kingdom. The ministry of the kingdom. In this passage of scripture in verses 9, 1 to 6. Especially the first two verses. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Luke shows the flow of power of Jesus the King, who extends the delivering and benevolent rule of the kingdom of God over hell's work, which is the demon's power, and human hurt, which is disease. The order of ministry that began with Jesus continues to be exercised by the disciples as he trained them for ministry and later will issue in the same type of ministry in their church as it spreads the gospel message. The gospel throbs with confidence in the full transparency of power and authority for ministry by Jesus to his disciples both then and now. We may expect victory over the powers of darkness and their operations. And we are assigned to do his business, authorized representatives of our Lord until he returns. And we are promised the Father's pleasure to give us the kingdom, that is, to supply us with his peace and his power. That's his kingdom, peace and power. So whatever situation we're going through, let's see things from above, receiving the kingdom's power and peace in all situations. Whether it's an unanswered prayer, loss of a loved one or what we're seeing on this earth that's happening during this time and season if we receive the authority <clears throat> that we have in, in Christ we have that spiritual breakthrough that gives us the authority through prayer, preaching, teaching and personal ministry that allows us to advance his kingdom for his glory. But it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost. Look at all the great men and women that went before us, both in the word of God and also those that are doing the Father's business at a, at a great, great price. have a look at an example in the scriptures of the cost that John paid Matthew chapter 14 verses 1 to 12 at this time Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants this is John the Baptist he has risen from the dead and has therefore these powers at work in him for Herod laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his, brother's, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him in a death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oath and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was bought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to the mother. And the disciples came and took away the body and buried it, and went and told Jesus. 
Herod is Herod Antipas, and that's another Herod in the great, uh, the great sons. And he ruled as the Tetrarch, which is a minor local ruler who over Galilee during Jesus' time. Herod had uh, succeeded Herodias, who was his niece and wife of his fo- uh, brother Philip. And he persuaded her to divorce her husband and marry him. The grisly accounts of John's death, indi- including Herod's cowardly role, explains Herod's paranoid response to the report about Jesus. Crazy how that uh, adultery and fidelity all caused that great prophet of John to have his head beheaded because of that one uh, agreement that was made. Ungodly agreement. Let's be mindful. Let's be mindful because Herod's intent was evil. And sometimes things in this earth are intended for evil, but God turns all things around for the good for those that love him and are called according to his purposes. But that was the cost that I was referring to. As also found in Mark chapter 6 verses 14 to 29. Let's have a look at another passage of scripture found in Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 13 to 21. It's now talking about the harmonizing of the Gospels on this beautiful miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them. And he healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitude away, and they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said, We have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, here, bring them to me. And he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. First he gathered them. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke it and gave it the loaves to his disciples. The disciples gave it to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets of full of fragments that remained. And now those who had eaten were about five thousand men, besides the women and children. I want to go into a couple of things here that helps us understand this um, message. Firstly, a word wealth. Moved with compassion. Strong's Accordance 4697. To be moved with deep compassion or pity. The Greeks regarded the, the bowls, which is the splanchnia, as the place where the strong and powerful emotions originated. The Hebrew regarded splanchnia as the place where tender mercies and feelings of affection, compassion, sympathy, and pity originated. It is the direct motive for at least five of Jesus' miracles. Jesus said, you give them something to eat. What was he saying there? The miracle of the 5,000 recorded by all four Gospels, gave a great teaching and a model from Jesus. He was giving them, his disciples, authority to to feed the 5,000. Because they were expecting him to do it because they felt that they were unworthy. But in his wonderful, gracious, merciful way, he gave them the loaves to give to the multitude, giving them the authority. Reflecting that the harvest was plentiful, but the workers was few was another indication. The five loaves and the two fish, and when he said, bring them here to me, gives us a couple of modeling um, examples from Jesus. Firstly, the gathering of the multitude was his model, bringing them together, as I mentioned earlier. Here, sit down. The second was that he blessed the food, always through prayer. The third was that he gave it to his disciples for their authority, Modeling that the disciples who gave it to the multitude. 
And the fifth was the remaining fragments drew attention to the abundance. The overabundance that was there for everybody. Jesus is the bread of life as he modeled in this. And the multitude that needed to look, or still need to look to him. And Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 was an indication and a pure modeling of how we are reaching human needs. Foreshadowed by the manna in the wilderness that happened even with those coming out of Egypt. So let's have a look at a couple of testimonies in our own lives and uh, reflections on how the Lord has been there for us. Even if we didn't believe him back then. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you remind, bring to remembrance the time that you were there with those who either lost a loved one or needed uh, to be fed and you fed them, whether it was spiritual or physical. Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, reveal it to them now so that your glory may be known. Amen. How has your needs and provisions been met through the trust that you had and have for him? And when you did receive, how did you respond? What about your spiritual needs? How have your spiritual needs been met in a place of dryness and barrenness? Just as with um, Hannah. She didn't have a child and there was a lot of uh, words being spoken over her life that didn't help. First of all, she had to believe. Secondly, she praised. Sing, O barren woman. She trusted in his, in, in, in his workings, but she had to look at him. The Lord blessed her <laughs> with more than one child. So if you're in a place of barrenness or in a place of need, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. If your spiritual needs have been met, ask the Lord how he can help you uh, fulfill that spiritual need in someone else's life. Mark also gave reference to the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6 verses 30 to 34. And there's a couple of points that I just want to share with you so that you may be able to go read the scriptures and uh, see what the Lord is saying to you. But here are some of the notes that I made. Jesus withdrew his disciples from the crowds in order to rest. He also did this to avoid the hostility of the Jewish religious leaders as well as the jealousy of Herod, as we've just learnt. But he also did another thing. He also taught the value of solitude. Time spent with the Lord. What about how he just spoke the word of God through his actions, through his word? Like sheep not having a shepherd, so he began to teach. Sometimes if there's a leaderless crowd, they are helpless and bewildered. If they choose to hear the truth, there's no need for that. But if people look to another source other than God for their prayers to be answered or situation to be delivered, that may bring in the confusion and the bewilderment. In this passage the blessings of Jesus with the 5,000 gave us another important lesson to remind ourselves is that it wasn't dependent on him he was dependent on his father for the miracle that would meet the needs of the needy people of the people that that needed the the help I want to read something that will help us help us uh, Prepare ourselves. Training to reign. God's power ministry. Jesus is modeling here how to function in the realm of the kingdom. And he astounds his disciples by telling them to use a small piece of food from a boy's lunch to feed more than 5,000 hungry people. He's teaching them that God has authority over everything, even that which cannot be seen. As we trust in him, we can expect and expand every resource we lack. John 6 verses 9 
spoke of how all four Gospels accounted for the miracle of the 5,000. Also that God has authority over everything, both seen and unseen. And we're going back to Colossians. Colossians 1 verses 15 shares with us that he is the firstborn over all creation. Hence the reason why we look to him. And verses 16, all things were created through him and for him. And in him all things exist. Remember we spoke a couple of weeks ago about the temple, about the living God. But we do this by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 verses 3, all the words were framed by the word of God. So we speak the word of God into existence because he wrote it into existence or spoken into existence. It was written afterwards. And as found in Luke chapter 9 verses 10 to 17, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. He spoke to them about the spiritual things. He was feeding them physically so that he could impart spiritual nourishment to them. But he did another thing there too. As he gathered them, he let them sit in groups of 50. And what did that mean? That meant that he was able to uh, have that individual or group impact. 50 versus 5,000. You can reach the 50 more effectively than what you could reach the 5,000. Which gave the need and the purpose for the laborers to go out into the harvest that was plentiful. To be discipled. To grow in the Lord. To show them the word of God and to be able to fill them with the Holy Spirit through his power, not ours. And that everything that was supplied to them was fulfilled. And their food, physical food was fulfilled because he fed the 5,000 besides the women and children. But he also spoke to them about the kingdom of God. But we also appreciate that when he withdrew to rest... He modeled that for his disciples to have that solitude, but also to avoid sometimes the confrontation that will distract them from their mission, doing the Father's business. So he has a couple of questions to ask. When last did you withdraw to receive the rest and solitude? And how much of that time was spent in praise, prayer, worship and study? And have you had an opportunity to share God's kingdom with others? And what steps have you taken in order to pray for others? <clears throat> John chapter 6 verses 1 to 4 was the last gospel that was speaking of the 5,000. And the Sea of Galilee wasn't known where his ministry took place. He was speaking of an earthly paradise and people responded with thoughts that Jesus had come into their world for an earthly paradise. Being their political bred Messiah. Making him king by force. But he wouldn't, have, he wouldn't have any of it as found in Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 to 4. Where he says it is written man shall not live by, live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So they were trying to put him in a position that would supply their physical needs. But he was saying to them, you cannot live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I want to read something for you. John chapter 6. Scriptures. No. To give thanks. Strong's Accordance 2168. From you, which is well, and from Sharis Mai, to give freely. To be grateful, to express gratitude, to be thankful. Eleven of the 39 appearances of the word in the New Testament referred to the partaking of the Lord's Supper. While 28 occurrences describe the praise words given to the Godhead. During the 2nd century, Eucharist became the generic term for the Lord's Supper, which we'll get through to in your time of reading in John chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. They gave thanks. They were filled with gratitude. What about Jesus walking on the water? Matthew chapter 14 gives us an indication as to what happened in this account.
Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 to 33. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he, sat, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up onto the mountain by himself to pray. Now when everything came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And then when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him, and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Here's a couple of things that Jesus said there. Be of good cheer. When they saw him walking on the water. It is I. Do not be afraid. Because they saw him and thought it was a ghost and cried out in fear. What about Peter's answer and reaction? And Jesus said, come. How that stepping out in faith allowed him to walk on the waters. But that caused two reactions. Firstly, the faith that he had in Jesus allowed him to walk on the water. But secondly, the fear that overcame him when he looked at his circumstances and not looked at Jesus. That caused him to start drowning. And when he said, please save me, save me. And Jesus put his arm down and brought him out. Oh, you are little faith. How do you doubt? The sea became the lifeboat. The winds and waves... They obeyed Jesus and they acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God. Mark is another illustration of what happened in this account in Mark chapter 6 verses 42 through to, sorry, 45 through to 52. For they had not understood about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. That's the main message out of that scripture, which you can read. Mark, in this context, described the disciples' fear that they had just seen Jesus multiply the loaves for the masses in need, but not able to apply his all-sufficiency to their own needs. And in John chapter 6, verses 15 to 21, where it was uh, the account of John, in contrast to the concept of Jesus as an earthly ruler with limited power, in walking on the water, Jesus reveals himself as having supreme authority over the whole universe. So as we continue our journey, as we look to the rock for our provision, let's keep these verses and uh, accounts in our hearts to trust in him, not to have fear, but have faith, hope and love. And also when that storm is battering us about, let's look to Jesus. And if he says, come, step out, let's keep our eyes fixed on him. Otherwise, we look at the circumstances we might drown. <clears throat> he is the provider. He is the healer. He is the sustainer. He is life. Let's pray. Lord, as you sent out the 12 in this context, in this passage, we ask that you pray for, that we pray for the harvest and the laborers. Lord, we ask that uh, you, bring, you bring about those that love you and are called according to your purposes. To remember their calling, their mission, and eternal salvation that they have in you. To bring about repentance, to bring about remission of sins as you did, as well as baptism. Lord, I ask for opportunities for the gospels to be the gospel to be expanded and for your name to be known. And we ask for prayer, for provision, and for comfort and protection, as you did for the five thousand, as you did for those that lost loved ones. 
And we pray that more people come into the kingdom of God through the glory and goodness of your good and pleasing will. To heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons and cleanse the lepers. Freely we have received, freely we give, Lord. So we just pray for all those out there that hear this message. Bring them into your covenantal, everlasting love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, sending you lots of love and we'll catch up with you for the next uh, message. But uh, be strong, be courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go.